Good morning. Welcome back to Bentonville 156, the Carolinas Campaign Virtual Event. My name is Derek, and we have a full exciting day of programming for you that includes presentations, demonstrations, and virtual guided tours. Leading off this morning is award-winning Civil War author and historian Eric J. Wittenberg. A native of southeastern Pennsylvania, Eric was educated at Dickinson College, the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, and the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. He is a partner in the Columbus, Ohio law firm of Cook, Slatoge, and Wittenberg, where he manages the firm's litigation practice. Wittenberg is the author of 22 critically acclaimed books on the American Civil War, several of which have won awards, as well as, well as more than three dozen articles published in national magazines. He is in regular demand as a speaker and tour guide and travels the country regularly doing both. He serves on the Board of Trustees for the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust and the Little Bighorn Associates, and often works with the American Battlefield Trust on battlefield preservation initiatives. Eric is also the Programs Coordinator for the Chambersburg Civil War Seminars. His specialist is Calvary Operations in the Civil War. He's been a true and faithful supporter of the Friends of Bentonville Battlefield, and he joins us today from Columbus, Ohio, where he resides with his wife, Susan. Thank you so much for participating this morning, Eric. Your continued support of Bentonville Battlefield is greatly appreciated. I wanted to thank Derek Brown from the Bentonville, Bentonville Battleground for inviting me to uh, participate in this virtual event. Uh, and I look forward to the next time being able to do so in person. Uh, I have always been a supporter of the efforts of the uh, Bentonville Battleground and its staff. Uh, and I continue to do so at a, every opportunity. And I, it was my honor and my privilege to agree to participate when Derek invited me uh, to speak to you virtually today. So with that, we'll begin our conversation about cavalry operations during the Carolinas campaign of 1865. I do apologize for the fact that uh, this image is a little blurry. Unfortunately, it's not very high resolution, but we will nevertheless get started and we'll do so now. We'll jump ahead to a much more uh, well-defined uh, image, which is this map of the course of the Carolinas campaign. Of course, it began when Sherman's uh, Army of the West left its camps in Savannah, Georgia on the 1st of February of 1865. Uh, Sherman's destination was Goldsboro, and specifically the railroad spurs at Goldsboro, where he intended to resupply his army uh, before heading into Virginia. The whole idea was to inflict some punishment on the civilian morale of the Carolinas. His men in particular were uh, eager to punish South Carolina, which it viewed as being the uh, place where the war began. So they were, they were eager to uh, visit some retribution on the citizenry of South Carolina. Uh, he would along the way make numerous feints so as to deceive the Confederates as to his intended destination. So as an example, early on, they will faint in the direction of Augusta, which was the site of the Confederate powder works, when in reality he was headed from, for Columbia. And then when he leaves Columbia, they'll faint in the direction of Charlotte but really was headed to Fayetteville because of the Cape Fear River, which was navigable up to that far north. And then uh, again, faint in the direction of Raleigh when in reality his destination was Goldsboro. This was a remarkable campaign. It covered about 240 miles all on foot. And as you can see from the maps, there's a, a great number of significant water courses that had to be uh, addressed during the course of the campaign. Uh, just look at South Carolina. You've got the Edisto, the Saluda, the Broad, the Santee, and the PD, all of which run more or less on a diagonal from northwest to southeast. There's also a great deal of lowland, uh, in particular in the opening phases of the campaign, where they're going to have to deal with swamps and building corduroyed roads through the swamps. So it, it's a remarkable campaign. So the question is, how do you visualize cavalry uh, and its role during the American Civil War? Here are the images of uh, George Custer and Phil Sheridan on the left and Nathan Bedford Forrest and Jeb Stewart on the right and Wade Hampton depicted uh, in his personal duel with a Michigan trooper 
on East Cavalry Field at Gettysburg on July 3, 1863. The role of cavalry changed. Traditionally, the role of cavalry was scouting, screening, and reconnaissance, but the institution of new weaponry, and in particular, uh, rapid firing, breech loaded, loading carbines, and especially those that were repeaters, such as the uh, Henry or Spencer carbines, really caused the doctrine of Civil War cavalry to evolve. Uh, from those traditional roles of cavalry to really more of a mounted strike force. So things are changing. Older generals like William Tecumseh Sherman weren't quite as quick to pick up on those changes. That's a factor that will come into play as we talk about these things. So again, the traditional cavalry mission, scouting, screening, and reconnaissance, serving as the eyes and ears of the army, in other words, finding the enemy, preventing the enemy from finding you, and protecting the army as it advances. So for much of the Carolinas campaign, the cavalry division that was assigned to Sherman's army will be operating on his left flank. Why? Screening the army from Confederate forces known to be operating in Georgia. So we'll talk a little bit about some of these various and sundry cavalry actions uh, depicted in the upper right hand corner is Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick uh, who was the commander of Sherman's Cavalry Division. You see some of uh, Kilpatrick's men de depicted down there in the lower right-hand corner. And you see the movements, <clears throat> excuse me, on this excellent map by Mark Moore of the cavalry as it makes its way in particular uh, through North Carolina, headed in the direction of Fayetteville on a collision course with Confederate cavalry uh, accompanying William J. Hardee's infantry uh, after it escaped from Charleston uh, and headed in the direction of the Cape Fear River in Fayetteville. There was also any number of non-traditional uh, missions that Sherman's cavalry will play. Some of it depicted on the left, you see them operating uh, kind of as skirmishers that are out leading the way on the right. Uh, a major effort of Sherman's cavalry is tearing up railroads, and uh, you see them doing that in the, the image depicted on the right. They'll often end up melting those rails and wrapping them around trees in what were called Sherman's bow ties. So the major leaders on both sides, you have Judson Kilpatrick. For most of the campaign, actually for the entire campaign, you have Major General Joseph Wheeler, and then for the latter half of the campaign, you have Lieutenant General Wade Hampton. We'll talk a little bit about each of these men as we proceed. Kilpatrick, born in Deckertown, New Jersey, five feet, three inches tall. He was uh, weighed about 130 pounds, graduated in the West Point class of 1861. As you can see, he's a funny looking little fellow. Uh, he was the first regular army officer wounded in the war uh, when he was in the 5th New York Infantry at the Battle of Big Bethel in June of 1861. Uh, he, when he returns to duty, he returns as the Colonel of the 2nd New York Cavalry, where he earns the unflattering nickname of Kilt Cavalry for his uh, penchant for killing the horses of his campaigns. Uh, I love the description of him by Charles Francis Adams, the grandson and great-grandson of two presidents of the United States who called him a frothy braggart without brains. Sherman called him a hell of a damn fool, but also said of him, yeah, he's a hell of a damn fool, but he's exactly the kind of man I want to lead my cavalry on this expedition, meaning the uh, campaign to capture uh, Atlanta. And as we'll see, he had quite the reputation with the women. Love this com comment by the member of Sherman's staff. These cavalrymen are positive nuisance. They're good for nothing but to run down horses and steal chickens. Well, that's not entirely true, but it certainly had that perception. This is Kilpatrick with his late wife. He married later again in life, had uh, 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 several children. And as you can see by the image, uh, he was the great, great grandfather of Anderson Cooper of CNN. And if you ever get the opportunity to see a photograph of the two of them together side by side, uh, you'll see that there is a, a very strong resemblance that even you can see even all these decades later. Opposing him for nearly the entire campaign 
Little Joe Wheeler, as he was known, also called the war child. Some called him Bragg's pet. He was 30, born in Connecticut, but raised in, in uh, Georgia. He was five feet, five inches tall and weighed 120 pounds. And you can see from the photo and, and the right hand side from the Spanish American War, he really was quite a little fellow. Uh, two years ahead of uh, Kilpatrick at West Point, graduated in class of 1859, but ironically finished dead last in cavalry tactics. He was brave, no question about it. He was a fighter. He was wounded in battle three times. He lost five horses, shot out from under him, but he was an absolutely wretched disciplinarian. And because of that, his command tended to be undisciplined and at times unreliable, and we'll see some of that as we continue. Uh, in fact, the people of Georgia were more afraid of, Sherman, of Wheeler's men and their depredations as they pursued Sherman's army across Georgia during the march to the sea than they were of Sherman's bummers. So consequently, you have the, the statement at the bottom, while the enemy were burning and destroying property on one side, Wheeler's men were stealing horses and mules on the other. So this is the great PD River. This is one of the significant obstacles that will have to be dealt with by both armies as they make their way north. You can see in the image there what are called the grassy islands, and that's exactly what they are. They're very low uh, grass covered islands that, that Wheeler will use uh, in crossing his cavalry as it advances from South Carolina into North Carolina. The Great Petey River is in fact the boundary between the two states. Joining the campaign in mid-February will be Lieutenant General Wade Hampton, born in Columbia, reputedly the, we the wealthiest man in the South, uh, a 46-year-old, uh, no other way to describe him than as an aristocrat, a Southern aristocrat, uh, six feet tall, weighed about 240 pounds, had no formal military education, but proved himself to be extremely capable. He was wounded. I believe if ne ne the count is correct, I think seven times in battle during the war. And with Jeb Stewart's death, he was next in line to command Robert E. Lee's cavalry, the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, as indicated, Hampton was from uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, he was very concerned about protecting his home state. There wasn't much going on that required the use of cavalry in the trenches around Petersburg, Virginia at the time. So in February of 1865, he requested and was granted leave to uh, take his division <clears throat> from the Army of Northern Virginia and to join the Confederate troops trying to defend South Carolina. Problem though is, is that Joe Wheeler outranked Hampton. He was senior by virtue of date of promotion, and Hampton absolutely and categorically refused to serve under Wheeler's campaign. Well, there was only one way to fix that, and that was to promote him over top of Wheeler, and that's exactly what was done. So Hampton will end up being the highest ranking cavalry officer in all of the Confederate service through the four years of the American Civil War. He outranks even Nathan Bedford Forrest, whose commission as Lieutenant General came a couple of days after Hampton's. Uh, to give Joe Wheeler credit, he uh, was happy to serve under Hampton's command and they, they did work together effectively. Uh, you can see the description of Hampton at the bottom. He was a big, strong, vigorous man. He'd lost a brother in combat at Brandy Station on June 9, 1863. He'd had one son killed in combat and. Uh, in this, during the siege of Petersburg in 1864, and he, his other son was badly wounded. So he had his own personal ax to grind. We have here Hampton's Grudge, as it's known. Uh, and there at the bottom, you see, in fact, what, what I just mentioned to you about his brother and son being killed, his other son being wounded. Millwood uh, was the family plantation outside of Columbia. Diamond Hill was another property that he owned in South, I believe in Charleston, if I'm not mistaken. And then there was the Woodlands. And uh, Hampton's going to end up losing all three of his homes. So, as we mentioned, we had this issue of who ranks whom. And uh, Hampton had to be promoted over top of Davis. But you also have issues with command control in the Carolinas. 
at one point you have three Confederate full generals acting in that theater of operations. You see in the upper left, PGT Beauregard, who was in command of the troops in South Carolina, uh, Joseph Wheeler, who'd been brought out of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Joseph Johnston, who'd been brought out of semi-retirement and assigned command troops in North Carolina, and Braxton Bragg, who also commanded troops in North Carolina, all of whom are four-star generals. It's a mess, and it cr will create command control uh, issues. So we have here a variety of uses of the cavalry, engagements involving the cavalry, and a variety of successes and failures. Uh, these are mainly Union cavalrymen, although you do see a Confederate in the lower left. Uh, it's interesting to see how these fellows are armed. You look at the upper left-hand corner, he's got two pistols, he's got his saber, he's got, uh, looks like he's got a bayonet there, he's got all sorts of interesting things. So he's prepared to go into battle. So as the Confederates are falling back after having been driven away from the line of uh, the initial defensive lines in, in the southern part of uh, South Carolina when they're driven off of the Salkahatchee River, uh, Sherman will order Judson Kilpatrick to make a feint in the direction of Augusta, Georgia. As mentioned, there is the major Confederate powder works were in Augusta, and uh, it was felt that if he could draw some of these, <coughs> excuse me, Confederate forces off in that direction, it would simply uh, open the road and make his path to Columbia uh, much smoother. So Kilpatrick with his three brigades of cavalry, and then I'll eventually end up with a fourth of dismounted men that lost their horses, uh, sort of creating sort of an ad hoc command, uh, make a feint in the direction of Augusta, and Wheeler bit at the feint. Wheeler's hometown was Augusta, and even though he had orders to remain along the line of the Edisto uh, as part of the main body of the Confederate forces, of which there were only about 15,000 available to defend against Sherman's army along the line of the Edisto, uh, Wheeler takes his 4,000 cavalrymen and heads off in the direction of Augusta. And he gets to the town of Aiken, which is 13 miles from Augusta, uh, before Kilpatrick does, and he lays a trap in the streets of the town. He waits for, and he creates this sort of U-shaped formation that you can see depicted on Mark Moore's map from my book there. And they, they wait until the brigade of Brigadier General Smith Atkins, with Kilpatrick leading the way, enter the town before they pounce on this Union command. And uh, in what was described as five or 10 minutes of blind confusion, you have this just nasty fight in the streets of the town of Aiken. And Aiken's a lovely town. Uh, it was then too, it was a resort town. So this sort of uh, urban cavalry mounted fighting is really an unusual thing. <clears throat> there are only a handful of instances of it that we've been able to document during the course of the Civil War. But Patrick. It barely escapes being captured. He leads his troopers back out of the town of Aiken. They retreat about five miles along the path of the Carolina Railroad back to a place called Johnson's Turnout. It is today called Montmorency, South Carolina, uh, where the other two brigades of Kilpatrick's division are waiting. Uh, so he falls back and, and is reinforced. And at that point, Wheeler breaks off the engagement having driven uh, Kilpatrick back. It is a, a real surprise that Kilpatrick went forward into a trap like that without taking steps to send out flankers and scouts to ascertain what was in his front. Had he done so, he might not have fallen into the ambush. He will not learn from this lesson. So the Battle of Aiken, the last Confederate cavalry victory in the Western campaign of the American Civil War, February 11, 1865. So in the meantime, after Aiken, Sherman will then head to the Northeast. He'll go to Columbia. We'll talk about that. From Columbia, 
They'll then advance in the direction of Shara on the uh, Great PD River. They'll then cross into North Carolina. In the meantime, a large force of Union miscellaneous troops, there's no other way to describe them. They haven't, it's not a coherent co command that has, it's rather an ad hoc force that's been put together uh, under the command of John M. Schofield has gathered in Goldsboro, a force under command of Jacob D. Cox of Ohio will head out of Goldsboro in the direction of Kinston, uh, hoping to clear the way and to restore the North Carolina Railroad to make sure that it's fully operational between Goldsboro and even as far as Raleigh as they can get. So this force that's commanded by Jacob D. Cox will be pounced upon uh, by a command under command of Bra Braxton Bragg that consisted of Daniel Harvey Hill with elements of the Army of Tennessee, uh, hoax division from the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, plus some of these other miscellaneous North Carolina forces. And during the course of a pretty nasty three-day battle that will take place uh, March 8, 9, and 10, uh, at Wise's Forks outside of Kinston. There will be a, a cavalry engagement, as you can indicate here, that uh, the 12th uh, New York Cavalry, commanded by Colonel James W. Savage, did not perform its duty well. And uh, in fact, exposed uh, the Union forces to a crushing attack from two different sides uh, by Hogan Hill that will send that command falling backward uh, on Wise's Forks itself. <clears throat> so you see the quote from Cox, the conclusion cannot be avoided that the duty assigned the cavalry on that road had been grossly ne neglected as obedience to orders before given could not have failed. And then we come to the Battle of Monroe's Crossroads, one of my favorite topics. Uh, this is a print of a painting by a fellow named Martin Pate. It's part of a series depicting the Battle of Monroe's Crossroads. It was commissioned by the United States Army. Uh, you see there the Charles Monroe House depicted in the upper right-hand corner and sleeping Union cavalrymen being attacked in their camps very early on the morning of March the 10th of 1865. Here we have now Wade Hampton in command of the Confederate cavalry. Uh, he has with him Wheeler's Corps, roughly 4,000 men, and he has his old division now commanded by Major General Matthew Calbraith Butler, consisting of two brigades uh, that are also with him. Their job is to buy time. Kilpatrick has been pursuing roughly 8,500 uh, Confederate infantry commanded by Lieutenant General William J. Hardy that are trying to make their way to Fayetteville to get across the Cape Fear River with Kilpatrick pursuing. And uh, the object of the, what will become the Battle of Monroe's Crossroads is not necessarily a Confederate victory, although that would certainly have been nice. It was instead to buy time to allow Hardy's Corps to make its escape. Now, Kilpatrick will establish his camp around with one of his brigades, two of his brigades. He's got the Mounted Brigade, of Colonel George E. Spencer, and he's also got the dismounted men that are traveling with him. They'll make their campsite right around the house of Charles Monroe, just south of the intersection of the uh, Blues Rosin Road and the, the Morganton Road, known as Monroe's Crossroads. Now you also note the presence of Nicholson Creek. Uh, that is a rather deep swale that in, in the winter and spring of 1865, which was very wet, was a swamp because it was flooded. And in some places it was an impenetrable swamp. Uh, it still is that way to this day. If you visit there after a heavy rain, you'll see it's uh, it gets quite wet down there. But the whole idea was that the Confederates were going to pitch into Kilpatrick's force. Now, Kilpatrick had only left a single company of the 5th Kentucky on the Morganton Road to picket his camp, and the Confederates will capture that entire company intact, meaning that there's nothing to put up an early warning. They develop this plan that Wheeler's entire corps will attack from the west uh, through the swamp 
while Butler's division will attack from the north, a detachment of uh, Pierce Manning Butler Young's brigade of Butler's division will be given the task of capturing Kilpatrick, who has made his headquarters in the Charles Monroe house. He's in there, uh, Colonel Spencer's in there, Lieutenant Colonel William Way, the commander of the dismounted men, is there along with several staff officers, as well as an unidentified woman known only as Alice, who was traveling with Kilpatrick, uh, who was his uh, nighttime companion. Uh, Kilpatrick's also got two pieces of horse artillery with him, commanded by Lieutenant Ebenezer Stetson. You see them depicted just to the house of the, the south of the Monroe House. Well, the attack launches at dawn. They catch the Union troopers completely off guard. Uh, the Union troopers are driven back into the swamp, and unfortunately, all command control of the UK Confederate forces break down because these Confederates are hungry. And there's lots of food to plunder and lots of good things to plunder in the Union camp. And rather than continuing to press and pursue their advantage, they stop to help themselves. Elements of Humes's division in particular of Wheeler's Corps will bog down in the swamp. Uh, Thomas Harrison, the commander of the southernmost brigade of Texans, will end up being uh, uh, severely wounded in fighting. Hagen will be wounded in fighting. Eventually, Kilpatrick hears this commotion. He comes out on his front on the front porch of the house to see what's going on, dressed only in his nightshirt. The Confederate officer that's been sent to capture him sees him there and says, "Where's General Kilpatrick?" And Kilpatrick at least has the the uh, presence of mind to point at a man galloping off on horseback and say, tell this Confederate officer, that's him. So the Confederate goes after the, the poor man on horseback and Kilpatrick retreats into the house. Uh, he waits there until an opportunity presents and then still clad only in his nightshirt, retreats down into the swamp. They eventually are able to rally the routed troopers there and they recapture their camps. And at the end of the day, Hampton having accomplished his goal, which was to tie up the Confederate or the Union cavalry for an entire day, breaks off the engagement when he learns that uh, a division of the 14th Corps is coming to uh, reinforce Kilpatrick. So he simply breaks off and withdraws. After having inflicted some pretty heavy casualties on Kilpatrick, including capturing Kilpatrick's favorite horse that was known as Spot, uh, Kilpatrick took an awful lot of ribbing because of his, uh, what they called shirt tail skedaddle. Uh, Monroe's Crossroads is a large scale engagement. It was something that the Confederates were very proud of. Uh, but again, the object was not to win a battle. It was to buy time. And that in that it succeeded. So this is bit March 10 on March 11. And then there's a depiction of the Confederate officer asking Kilpatrick uh, all about it. And of course, we don't know who Alice was. She was reputed to be a Northern school teacher who got stuck in the South, who was trying to make her way North and uh, had only one way uh, to pay for her transportation. I'll leave it to your imagination what that is. This is another one of Martin Pate's paintings. These are, are can, is a depiction of Alexander Shannon's uh, Confederate scouts, Captain Alexander Shannon of Texas, uh, part, who was a, a commissioned as a, an officer of the 8th Texas Cavalry. Shannon and his men were known for being really aggressive scouts. Uh, there is Alexander Shannon. Uh, as you can see, there was a $5,000 reward issued for him. Uh, these men were extremely effective. They were signed to Wheeler's command. Uh, and in fact, it was Shannon and his men that found the fact that the Union campsite at Monroe's Crossroads was unguarded. Hampton also had what he called his Iron Scouts. Uh, the Iron Scouts were, were known, again, for their intrepidness, for their willingness to go and uh, expose themselves to all sorts of dangers, uh, in return for which they generally brought back excellent intelligence, as well as you can see here, 75 horses that they captured on one excursion. <clears throat> on the 11th of March, <clears throat> excuse me, on the 11th of March, 
Captain William Duncan, who was the chief of scouts of the Army of Tennessee, which at that time was commanded by Major General Oliver Otis Howard, uh, has a detachment of mounted infantrymen. Uh, they will pursue Hardee's men into the town of Fayetteville. When they get to Fayetteville, they will find the rear guard of the Confederate command, which is Wade Hampton and uh, his staff and some scouts having breakfast near the market house in downtown Fayetteville. There'll be a brief uh, mounted skirmish in the town. Hampton will escape. They will then fall back across the Clarendon Bridge. And as the rear, the, the final elements of the uh, Confederate cavalry are falling back across the bridge, some of Captain Duncan's scouts arrive. There is a brief skirmish, and then the Clarendon Bridge is destroyed by being burned by Hardy and his men. The Cape Fear River cannot be forded at Fayetteville. So this means that Sherman's going to have to have pontoon equipment floated up the river from Wilmington, and he'll be stymied there uh, in Fayetteville for several days, which in turn will allow Hardy to fall back to a defensive position as he heads in the direction of Smithfield, where he is to rendezvous with a force being uh, gathered there under command of General Joseph Johnston. So timing is everything in life, as, you, as they say, and uh, the timing of the arrival of these Union scouts in Fayetteville, uh, not quite good enough, uh, largely because of the, vic the uh, engagement at Monroe's Crossroads the day before that bought sufficient time for Hardy's force to make its escape. Depicted here, you see ca young Captain Theodore Northrop, who was all of 23 years old. He had started the war as a sergeant, was eventually uh, uh, promoted to captain, became Kilpatrick's chief of scouts. Uh, you see he's got quite a baby face, and there, there are some of the Union scouts that, that served under and with Northrop, often, as you can see, serving in civilian clothing. Uh, Northrop and his men will play a very important role at the March 16th, 1865 Battle of Averisboro. Uh, this is Corporal James Pike of the 4th Ohio Cavalry, who, after the war, wrote a famous book of... Uh, repeating his exploits during the course of the American Civil War. And you see where the areas he was operating in, in the eastern part of, of uh, North Carolina, gathering intelligence, gathering information, finding out what he could find out, usually operating alone. Had he been captured, he was in uniform or uh, in Confederate uh, civilian clothing. And had he been captured, he likely would have been executed as a spy almost immediately. But uh, Corporal Pike uh, wrote a, a, an embellished but highly entertaining and highly readable published memoir after the war. So you heard me mention the role played by Captain Theodore Northrup and his scouts at the Battle of Averisboro. Uh, as you can see, depicted in the image in the middle here, uh, Colonel Alfred Rett, who commanded one of the brigades of infantry under command of Hardy. Uh, got trapped behind the lines that morning during the fighting at, at Averisboro and was surrounded and captured by some of uh, Captain Northrop's scouts and brought back uh, and presented to William Tecumseh Sherman, much to Sher Sherman's uh, amusement and uh, not so much to Rhett's amusement, who will spend what's left of the war as a prisoner of war after having been captured in a somewhat embarrassing faction. So in addition, Sherman has with him mounted infantrymen. Uh, these men are performing their own functions. They use their, their horses to, or mules to move from place to place. They then dismount and fight using infantry weapons and infantry tactics. Uh, this is a way of increasing the mobility of an army. Uh, William Stark Rosecrans used it effectively and extensively with the Army of the Cumberland, uh, particularly in 1863-1864. And also, these mounted infantrymen ended up being the men given the unkind name of Sherman's Bummers. Uh, they were largely uh, scavenging 
uh, in the countryside, seizing food, seizing booty, uh, taking things, all of which was a part of the whole idea of breaking the will of the civilians. And Sherman's bummers uh, left a large wake of destruction behind them as they passed through. Uh, consequently, uh, if they the local men would bushwhack them, if you got caught and you were out foraging, as they called it, uh, alone, there was a good chance you were gonna get bushwhacked. So uh, this is ugly stuff, folks. This is raising the black flag. And you see that uh, uh, there's a quote by one of Sherman's bummers that specifically said, the rebels don't drive worth a damn. Finally, we come to the Battle of Bentonville, March 19, 20 and 21, 1865. You see Wade Hampton depicted largely because the battle plan that the Confederates will execute at the Battle of Bentonville was developed by Wade Hampton. And uh, his troopers will play some role in the engagement, but mostly this is a stand-up infantry fight. And uh, they caught Sherman's army by surprise at Bentonville, as you well know, and uh, nearly defeated it on the first day uh, in detail. Uh, had that Johnston had more men, I suspect he might very well have won the battle. Didn't matter to Sherman, he was still trying to make his way to Goldsboro and uh, it delayed him, but it didn't stop him. So there's a couple of men here that had particularly notorious reputations as they traveled uh, with Sherman's men. On the left, you see Captain George W. Graham, who was a North Carolinian who had remained loyal to the Union. He was killed uh, in Rockingham early in March as the uh, army of Sherman made its way into North Carolina. Uh, his body was rescued, but he was dealt with severely because he was considered to be a disloyal North Carolinian who had not gone with the Confederacy. George Spencer was a, a congressman from Iowa who commanded a brigade of Union men from Northeastern Alabama, the first Alabama Union Cavalry. And uh, these guys also were treated as traitors by their uh, counterparts on the Confederate side and the first Alabama Confederate and the first Alabama Union met more than once uh, on, on fields of battle and, and in particular did so uh, at Monroe's Crossroads. Spencer and his men were known for being uh, ill-disciplined and for helping themselves uh, to whatever came across their, their path as they made their way through the country. Uh, and uh, you see the, the comment here from uh, the commander of the 17th U.S. Army Corps, Major General Francis Blair, uh, specifically addressed to, <clears throat> excuse me, Spencer when he says, the outrages committed by your command during the march are becoming so common and are of such an aggravated nature that they call for some severe and instant mode of corrections. So adding to the depredations of the bummers, you have these cavalry units that are not making friends and influencing people as they make their way through the Carolinas. Along the way in South Carolina, uh, Sherman's command, and in particular Kilpatrick's command, will pass through the town of Barnwell. Kilpatrick will order all the residents of the town to gather for what was supposed to be something he described as a ball. And once everyone gathered uh, for this engagement, uh, the town was set aflame and uh, Kilpatrick was heard to laugh, calling it Burnwell. And uh, there you see a depiction of Burnwell in flames. This is in February, before the Battle of Aiken. Finally, at the Battle of Bennett Place, and again, we have this uh, not very clear image, but uh, you have both Hampton on the left, escorting Joe Johnston and Judson Kilpatrick, escorting Sherman for their first meeting at the Bennett Place when the time came to discuss settlement. And while Sherman and Kilpat, excuse me, while well, Sherman and Johnston were inside discussing, trying to resolve events, <coughs> Hampton and Kilpatrick got into quite an argument, um, needling each other. 
and eventually it was suggested that 1500 cavalrymen of each side meet on the field of battle to uh, decide events but the uh, Hampton and, and Kilpatrick were yelling at each other they made such a ruckus that Sherman and Johnston had to interrupt their meeting to come out and separate the two men and when they met again the next day Sherman and Johnston that is neither Kilpatrick nor Hampton were present so we'll talk just a little bit about Civil War cavalry uh, on the left you have a monument uh, there are two identical copies of this monument. One of them is in Middleburg, Virginia, in the Loudoun Valley. The other can be found at Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, as you can see, it is a monument to the cavalry horses of both armies. Uh, as you can see, the horse who's depicted there is scrawny and used up, but yet he did his duty like so many others did. Old Bob, as you can see there, of course, was killed at the Battle of Bentonville on March 19, 1865. Um, so that ends our conversation. Uh, I regret that I'm not there live to answer questions for you, but I hope that as we have proceeded today, you have gained some insight and learned a few things. And for uh, further information or to order books, please visit my website. I have published books on Bennett Place, Monroe's Crossroads, and the Battle of Aiken. And again, I thank Derek Brown for inviting me to participate today. I hope the event is a great success, and I look forward to seeing you in person next time around.